Hello and welcome to Look North. Our top story tonight. Donny's done it. Doncaster's granted city status ahead of the Platinum Jubilee. The budget. Excellent. Yes, I like it. Yes. Thank you very much. You very We're city. Woo! Well, I just want to thank the Queen for that. But what difference will it make to you if you live there? Also tonight. The teenagers helping their peers cope with exam stress. It's make or break for Leeds United, their last chance this weekend to stay in the Premier League. And a celebration of the humble Bumblebee for World Bee Day. And a lot of settled weather to come this weekend, but there will be quite a bit of cloud as well. I'll be back later in the programme with all the very latest. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, after three failed attempts, Doncaster has been awarded city status as part of this year's Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. It's one of eight places to have been chosen and it's hoped it will attract extra investment. The judges highlighted the royal connections, the industrial heritage and the community spirit shown in the recent flooding. Well, on tonight's programme, we'll get the thoughts of politicians, business leaders and the people of Doncaster. But first, our political editor, James Vincent, has an idiot's guide to all things Doncaster. Welcome to the city of Doncaster. Here's what you need to know. It's massive. North to south, Thorn to Tickill is 20 miles. It's the home of horse racing. The St Ledger was first run in 1776 and it's the oldest classic horse race in the world. We go further back than that though. 1194 was when Doncaster Market got its first charter from King Richard I. It's home to the grand old age of the railway as well. Both the Flying Scotsman and Mallard were built here. As for famous sons and daughters, well, Youngblood, Diana Rigg, Kevin Keegan, Jeremy Clarkson, Brian Blessed, Tan France and Leslie Garrett. Doncaster's had many names, but whatever it's called in the future, you're going to have to stick City in front of it, because the Queen says. There you go, you learn something new every day. Well, uh, our reporter Phil Bodmer has spent the day in Doncaster and he's live for us tonight. Phil, it's kind of a big deal, isn't it? It is a big deal, Amanda. Yes, I remember coming back here, standing here in the 1980s when this was not far from the coal house, which was run by the National Coal Board, of course, this town heart of the mining industry. Over the last decade or so, there's been a dramatic transformation in this part of the world. That is the brand new Danum uh, Museum and Art Gallery. Here are the council offices. Don't they look extraordinary? Uh, beyond that is cast, that's a, a theatre. And then just a bit further on is a cinema complex too. So what does city status mean? Well, I think many people are excited about that uh, prospect here in Doncaster today. And I hope it will continue with this regeneration that we've seen in recent years. A brighter future blooms for Doncaster. For most we spoke to today, a sense of pride at the birth of a new city although some seemed a little unsure about the accolade. They weren't it, with what they're trying to do, clean, tidy, people's happy, go OK, give them a chance, what, what they can't lose. It's good, I like Donny because um, cause my son comes here for, for college, she comes here on Fridays for maths. Most of the shops are shut in on town, you see half the people who are in Donny, they're on the streets, homeless, it's, it's not very city state. So you're not sure it's worthy of city state? No. I mean, I know they've tried numerous times over the years but you know they never never got there but they got there this time and that's good so I just want to thank the Queen for that. Recognised for its community spirit during the 2019 floods <laughs> links to royalty through the world famous St Ledger horse race and its rich history. Doncaster Minster keeps a watchful eye over the city where a church has stood for over eight centuries. Nearby Conisbrough Castle dating back to the 12th century, inspiring Sir Walter Scott's novel, Ivanhoe. And a city of architectural contrasts, from the former girls' high school to its growing airport, used by more than a million people each year. The residents of Doncaster went to bed last night in a town. This morning, they woke up in a city. And if you want proof of that, just take a look at Google Maps. In the bustling marketplace, a rosy outlook for traders, delighted to say they're now working in the city. There's a lot of external investment coming into Doncaster, which is good to see. There's warehouses all around the outskirts, a lot of people coming to the town centre, city centre. <laughs> it's getting used to that, same. Yeah, that, I know, it? I know. I work in the city now. 
Meanwhile, at the town's cricket club, there may be some administrative tidying up to do. The area that we play on, our home ground is down to town, town field, and... The committee have just spent a load of money on new shirts <laughs> that say Doncaster Town Creek, so until they've sold all them, I can't see anything happening, really. But they're still supping to city status. Cheers! Following the collapse of the coal industry, Doncaster needed to look for new opportunities to grow. Being granted city status offers another, and this one comes with a royal seal of approval. Well, this is uh, Nigel Gresley Square in Doncaster, and as you can see, quite a lot of optimism about what city status could mean. Let's talk to Roz Jones, the mayor of uh, Doncaster. Roz, uh, this is a bit of a red-letter day, isn't it? How do you feel? Look, I was on cloud nine. It's actually going to help us fulfil all our aspirations, all our desires and driving our borough through economic regeneration, which is what often city status brings. And it's Team Doncaster that's delivered and we've got some of them here. It's the third time that the, 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 the town has tried to become a city. At last, you've achieved it. Are you confident it will bring extra investment, elevating the status of Doncaster? Well, I, I look what happened in Perth, and they've been a uh, city for 10 years, and their economy's grown by 12%. That will do for us. We will be there working, every one of us together, because it's a team approach, and we'll, we'll get there. And I'm sure the people of Doncaster will be holding you to that, Ron. I'm sure they will. <laughs> Let's talk to uh, Cheryl Williams from the Yorkshire Wildlife Park. Uh, Cheryl, yeah. uh, you invested in this area. You came, set up the wildlife park. What do you think it means? I, I think it's absolutely massive. And, of course, we came in 2008, so we've actually seen how the town has grown and how it's developed. And, do you know, I mean, the people are wonderful. They really supported us and what we got from Business Doncaster as well in terms of just help and support and encouragement because it sounded a pretty odd idea to come and start a wildlife park in Doncaster. It was, some people say it's a brave move, but it's been very successful for you, hasn't it? And the people have responded, South Yorkshire people have, have, have embraced it, haven't they? Massively. And it's part of a very wide leisure and cultural offer here. You know, we've got a lot of annual pass holders that live in, in the city. And, you know, it's, it's just a great resource. A lot of the school children go to us. But really, I think it, it's profile for Doncaster. And on the international stage as well, I think it would be great. Well, wish you well, uh, Cheryl, and thank you for your involvement so far. Let's talk to some young people now who are involved very much in this, uh, this bid because you guys were, got involved. Let's talk to Owen. Um, Owen, you were involved with the Youth Forum to get involved. What, what did it involve? What, what, what did you have to do to take part in a city bid status? Um, so it was actually really exciting. So as part of Doncaster Youth Council, I worked with myself, uh, Courtney and Sam. We were part of the new team, Doncaster. Uh, we gave young people's opinions, our thoughts. We made sure that our thoughts, opinions, like I said, it all came along. We made sure that everyone knew that what young people want, what we want to happen for Doncaster, and we wanted to make it a great time to live. We, we think it's a great place, and we want the other young people that lives in Doncaster to also represent and think that it's a good place to live. I can clearly live. see the pride you've got as young people, citizens of this, of this city now. Just briefly, what does it mean to you going forward, do you think? It's so exciting. The amount, we already knew Doncaster had so many opportunities before and we know that these opportunities are just going to get larger and larger and better and better and that's something that we're so excited for. OK, well, good luck, guys. Thank you for talking to us. Let's get uh, a word now from our political editor, James Vincent. James, with a political dimension on, what do you think this really means? Well, immediately, people won't notice a huge difference apart from the, the signs that will, will go up everywhere saying City of Doncaster. But people who are crunching the numbers are really hoping that there'll be an economic benefit. So, for example, in 2002, Preston beat Doncaster to be a city, then subsequently outperformed its counterparts regionally in terms of investment. They'll be hoping for a bit of that in Doncaster. We've got a new mayor in South Yorkshire. He's now got two cities to talk about while he's negotiating with the government and trying to get money from the government for, for new things in South Yorkshire. And I think it's really hard to overstate the, the pride element of it all as well, Phil, because there'll be 300,000 people who woke up this morning, like me, thinking, <laughs> nice one, get in, we've got a city, after 22 years and four attempts at it. Um, it's just it's good news for Doncaster. I don't think Doncaster Rovers will be changing their name to City anytime soon, though. No, I can't see that, Hamley. James, thank you very much. So, a sense of pride tonight here in Doncaster that, as a hand back, Amanda, it's not Doncaster Town anymore, it's the city of Doncaster. Paul Wonderful. Yours. Thank you very much, Phil. It's lovely to start with some positive news on the programme tonight.
next tonight. It's the time of year when many teenagers are about to take their exams. A-level students are already sitting theirs without ever having faced a real exam before because their GCSEs were cancelled in the pandemic. Tom Ingle has been to a school in South Yorkshire to see how they manage exam stress. So I've got my first day level starting on Monday. I'm a bit anxious, a bit stressed because it's been a long wait to be able to do them. On a Saturday, I usually take at least half a day off just to do nothing for a bit before getting back into it. I think it's important to establish a work-life balance even now. Who would want to sit here again? At Wales High School, they've thought about it. As students focus on A-levels, the staff are offering whatever support they can. We've got specialist pastoral staff in the school. We've got a number of different venues this year. So normally you'd have maybe 300 students sat in an exam hall. We have a number of extra venues this year to make sure that students can uh, feel more relaxed and, and feel better when they go into that actual exam situation. And in the build up to this, we've had extra revision sessions, both in the evenings and at weekends as well. But the secret weapon to zap pre-exam nerves could be the students themselves. A group at Wales have been trained as mental health ambassadors, there to share frank conversations with friends in a way perhaps previous generations never did. The fact that people are more aware of mental health now is amazing because it's not, we haven't got this massive thing that you can't talk about how you feel anymore. So the fact that people feel comfortable speaking to us just makes men, being a mental health ambassador worth it. They want more of a, a, a chat about the stresses and and in a way just to like vent and let it all out um, ready for ready for the exams to go into the exam fe feeling calmer. My friends often ask me like how exactly do you handle stress because my friends know me as a workaholic so they wonder how that <laughs> hasn't exactly got to me yet. So how do you handle the stress? So I usually checkpoint exactly what I want to get done because then I feel like I'm accomplishing something from day to day. It is stressful of course what part of school isn't but it's manageable and I think that's the most important thing about it. I've managed to um, organise uh, my revision work for all of my subjects pretty well and I think I'm quite comfortable, not too stressed out per se. Some are feeling the pressure more than others. What's lovely is that they are well prepared. So we've looked at um, stress, we've looked at work-life balance. Does it make a difference because the people sitting A-levels now have not sat a GCSE? It's definitely made a difference for them. And in terms of worried students, we do have more, more students that are a little bit more worried. We've got more students that are referred for our counselling. We have in-school counsellors as well. So we, we've throughout the year, we've had more of that. At Wales, managing stress is not just for exam season, but an all-year round task. Right now though it really matters, particularly for this year of students. Tom Ingle, BBC Look North, Wales. Oh, best of luck to everyone taking part in those exams. Now a West Yorkshire MP has thanked police for their response after threats were made this morning. Andrea Jenkins, the Conservative MP for Morley and Outwood, was not present at the time threats were made towards security staff at Morley Town Hall, but was safely escorted back to her office from the town centre. A man has been arrested on suspicion of a public order offence and is currently in custody. There's another warning about strike action on the region's trains this weekend. TransPennine Express says its services will be extremely limited on Sunday because of action by the RMT union. It says passengers should avoid travelling on Sunday if they can and some tickets will be accepted by other train companies. Now, it's five years this weekend since the Manchester Arena terrorist attack in which 22 people were killed and hundreds more were injured. On tonight's Look North, we're hearing from two Yorkshire families whose lives have been changed dramatically by the bomb attack. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Amelia Thompson and her mum Lisa, but first Becky Holmes has been back to meet the senior family from Queensbury. <coughs> This was the first time that we met the senior family as Amelia and her dad Andrew emerged from behind the police cordon on the night of the 22nd of May 2017. Suddenly like something really hot just flew over us and landed behind me and my mum and my sister and then we all like dropped to the floor. Amelia's mum Natalie and sister Eve suffered multiple shrapnel wounds which required ongoing treatment. So I need the trampoline first of all so let me just grab that. The road to recovery for the family meant many trips to see hospital physios and more surgery for Eve. What does it feel like when I'm pressing on it? Five years on, I went back to see how the family are now. 
I suffered 18 shrapnel wounds and a burn. I wasn't quite as injured as Eve was shrapnel-wise. I think I had about seven shrapnel wounds. Amelia suffered hearing damage in her left ear, but also struggled with guilt following the attack. When they were in operations and things, the fact that I was still walking round, I could still use both my legs and I still got out of bed in the morning and did what I wanted to do. And it was always really hard to uh, be such a young age and see all of the um, hurt and pain that can be inflicted on the people you love the most at that point in time. The care Eve received in hospital made a lasting impression. Before Manchester, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up at all, but when I'm older, I want to be a nurse. Eve isn't the only one that's embarked on a new career in the family. Amelia's working full-time in a childcare apprenticeship and volunteers in a local youth club. And after working in the family business for 17 years, Natalie decided to retrain in mental health nursing. But by trying to make positives out of a, a, a massive negative, um, and live the best lives that we can as a family. I think that's some tiny way of us being able to um, push, push forward um, and make things better in the world a little bit if we can, yeah, and help, help others, yeah. Becky Holmes with that report. Well, Amelia Thompson has appeared on Look North several times over the past five years, and she joins us tonight with her mum, Lisa. Uh, first of all, five years on, the pain clearly never goes away. How, how are you? I'm doing okay. Obviously, it's the anniversary on Sunday, so it is um, hard, um, especially on the day. Um, like I said, it, it never goes away and it will always stay with me every day, but it's helping others that really helps getting through that and it will be a definitely difficult time for not only me, but for my mum as well. And Lisa, you were there at the time yeah. as well. Presumably, you at least can support each other through the trauma that you saw. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different because obviously we saw different things. Um, and obviously a lot of survivors will say that, but it is nice being with other people and especially the families um, and seeing obviously like Sharon and Steve and June on Sunday means a lot to us as it does them. And Amelia, you say you keep busy, you certainly do. Just tell me a little <laughs> bit about all this fundraising you're involved in. Um, so I'm a young ambassador of Lives Trust, which is a charity set in memory of Olivia Campbell Hardy. Um, and I do quite a lot of... Um, uh, fundraising for them so I did a skydive which is my most recent thing wow. um, I do like singing gigs I main thing that I do is like I try and uh, hand out lives trust bands but I also do a lot on the other side as well so I've done like recently I've done a, a collection for doing uh, for Ukraine and their ongoing crisis that's happening at the minute and I arrange that with uh, my school so yeah it definitely helps keeping busy and giving back to those that really need it and you've been doing your exams as well. We've just been talking about exams. How, how are they going? <laughs> um, they're going good. It's definitely stressful, especially um, with them being around um, the anniversary. It is quite hard to get through them, but I'm managing. <laughs> and the anniversary, it's this weekend, isn't it? Just tell me who you'll be thinking of. Um, definitely, I'll be thinking of the 22 that lost their lives, but also the families and what they're going through at this current time. Um, being so close to the families like Sharon and Steve, it means a lot because mm. we can be supportive for them and, and then for us as well, they understand what we're going through, so it's quite nice to talk to them and open up to them about things. Oh, Amelia and Lisa, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be thinking of you over the thank weekend. You. And thank best you. of luck with those exams. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now on to sports and Leeds United are excited for the challenge of staying in the Premier League according to their head coach Jesse Marsh. After last night's results they know they have to better any result Burnley get on Sunday or they'll be relegated to the Championship. The final match of the season is away to Brentford. Here's Tanya. Hey guys. When Jesse Marsh entered for his final pre-match press conference of the season today he knew exactly what was at stake. Last night Everton won to secure their Premier League status. Burnley got a point at Aston Villa to lift them out of the relegation zone and put Leeds back in it. Their fate no longer in their own hands. Absolutely gutted by last night's result. At the moment, very nervous. Terrified. We're excited for this challenge. We know we have to be at our best. Um, 
I, I never came here to think that this was going to be easy or that it was a, a given that we were going to stay in the league. I knew we would have to fight for everything, and, and that's the way it's been. And and we'll make sure, I'll make sure that, that that's what, what I represent on Sunday and make sure that our team does the same. Jesse Marsh is expecting to continue as head coach next season, whatever happens. But relegation will have serious ramifications for the club. There needs to be a reset, and not least because they will lose some quality players. Calvin Phillips, England international, Rafinha, Brazil international. Elan Melier probably going to be the next France number one. You'd think that they'd all be sold, and they'd need that money to rebuild to come back up into the Premier League. Financially, I actually think that they will be in a far better place than they ever have been, well certainly in recent history, and that if they went down it wouldn't be as crippling and that they would be in a position to be able to challenge again next season. Right now, Jesse Marsh isn't thinking beyond Sunday. Preparing for that is key. The lads have been focused and and the desire to, to do whatever we can is at an extremely high level and we're going to need that. Got to win, no matter what. Uh, hopefully Newcastle can do us a favour. Like most Leeds fans, I'm down today, but fingers crossed for Sunday. What's the atmosphere like in a Leeds United supporting household in these circumstances? Terrible. Terrible. Yeah, um, the swearing, the arguing, it's not very good, to be honest. I'll be glad when, hopefully, we stay up. Oh, who'd be a football supporter, hey? Well, it's not all about the Premier League, of course, this weekend. York City are on the brink of returning to the National League. They just need to win their promotion final at home to Boston tomorrow. A sellout crowd of more than 7,500 is guaranteed. It should mean York City's biggest home attendance for 20 years. Day two of Yorkshire's match hasn't been helped by weather interruptions. This is cricket now, but uh, Yorkshire's Adam Lythe has still managed to complete his first century of the season. And Harry Brook has added 82. When they came off early for rain, Yorkshire were on 269 for four. That's a lead of 25 runs with two days remaining. Now, today is World Bee Day, when beekeepers and environmentalists around the globe stand up for bees and highlight their importance to us and the health of the planet. In our region, many groups and organisations are playing their part in supporting bees, and we can help too, mainly by letting wildflowers grow. Cathy Killick has more. At RHS Harlow Carr, they know a thing or two about flowers, but all their expertise is worthless without bees and insects. Without them, none of this would be possible. No flowers, no plants, no nothing. And that's why the garden has made a brand new home for bees, which was officially opened today. The John Annett Apiary will be run by Harrogate and Ripon Beekeepers Association. The 20 hives here will yield some honey, but most importantly, it'll train new beekeepers and raise bee colonies for them to take home. So we always open it away from us because if they are grumpy, the weather doesn't help, they'll fly up and away from us. You can see a few girlies here. They bring in pollen to make food for the brood. And in this corner, we've got larvae. Bee populations are under threat globally, which is bad news for all of us. Looking after them has become more important than ever. Pollination is so important globally. 75% um, of our um, food crops are pollinated. And if you took out all of the pollinators, we would um, have very little left to eat. It's a, it's a global problem. The whole area has been planted with uh, native trees. We're allowing the uh, grass to be uh, a lot wilder than other parts of the garden. And even in a short space of time, we've seen the increase in wildflowers and the increase in pollinators, insects, just in a short space of time. In Hebden Bridge, artists Sand in Your Eye are also helping get the message across with a 60-metre artwork at Hebden Royd Primary School. But it's not just honeybees that need recognition and protection. Wasps, solitary bees and other pollinating insects are every bit as crucial to the future of the planet. Safeguarding their habitat safeguards ours. And you get a beautiful garden to boot. Cathy Killick, BBC Look North, Harrogate.
Lovely, and if uh, we can help by not mowing the lawn, Keely, then so be it. Well, my husband will love that then. <laughs> <laughs> Any <laughs> excuse. <laughs> um, it's been, well, it's been quite cloudy today, hasn't it? We've had some showers in the mix uh, and there will be a lot of cloud over the weekend as well. Let's have a little look at some photographs that have come in over the last uh, 24 hours or so. This one is a gorgeous picture um, near Skipton. It was sunset last night, some little bluebells hanging on in there uh, in the foreground. The second picture was sunrise uh, this morning at the coast uh, in Scarborough. Thank you, Beverly, for sending that one in. And the third picture, some rather grumpy looking skies over Home Village. Um, Sandy says she was desperate to see some bees, but I'm afraid they were all hiding in that part of the world uh, today, apparently. Uh, you can keep your pictures coming into the BBC Weather Watchers page. You can tweet me at Keely Donovan or I'm on Instagram at Keely.Donovan. So a settled weekend and actually quite a lot of fine weather to come, but there will be quite a bit of cloud uh, in the forecast. Tomorrow it does look like it will be a largely dry day, the same can be said for Sunday. A lot of cloud, but I think it'll improve through the afternoon. It'll tend to brighten up and I think the best of the weather tomorrow will be first, first thing and then in the evening when we are expecting some sunshine. Relatively settled because of high pressure over the near continent, but the jet stream becomes more active, steering in weather systems from the Atlantic for next week and from Monday temperatures take a dip as well after a relatively mild mild weekend. So here's the radar from earlier on. You can see how the showers moved in uh, from the west. We had a bit of a lull late afternoon, but uh, another rash of showers has, will move through over the next hour or two and then clear skies and an improvement overnight. So clearing skies, a fine night to come uh, with temperatures uh, on the mild side only dropping back to around 9 or 10 degrees. Let's take a quick look at those high water times then. You're next in Bridlington, one minute past nine and at half past eight in Whitby. So if you're up and about early doors, uh, there will be quite a bit of sunshine. Blink and you'll miss it because it will cloud over from the west. And that cloud could be thick enough for a time through the day for the odd light shower. But for most places, it does look like a dry day. And the cloud will tend to thin and break through the afternoon, brightening up with uh, the best of the sunshine expected later in the afternoon and tomorrow evening. Temperatures getting up to uh, around uh, 17 or 18 degrees, so perhaps a shade higher than today. We did get up to 17 degrees down the Vale of York, a gentle southwest breeze. And temperatures uh, a couple of degrees higher again on Sunday. So Sunday will start off on a fine note once again. We'll always have more cloud in the west. The cloud will increase here. There could even be the odd spot or two of light rain or drizzle for the dales, maybe even the Pennines. But for most places, it does look dry and mild. Temperatures taking a dip on Monday. It will be unsettled for the first half of next week. And then temperatures climbing and things settling down for the second half of next week. There you go. Lovely. <laughs> I remember yeah. it in the end. Looking good for the weekend, at least. Thank you very much, <laughs> Keely. That is it from us. Do have a lovely weekend. We'll be back with your late news and weather just after 10 o'clock. Hope you can join us then. Goodbye. <laughs>